Laura Fowler is a mediator and an attorney who focuses on environmental and natural resource law, including all things water. Prior to joining Penn State in 2012, she worked on public policy issues for the Oregon Water Resources Department, attended the University of Washington School of Law, and practiced with a law firm in Seattle. As a private practitioner, she mediated issues such as groundwater storage rights in the greater Los Angeles area, chronic flooding issues in Washington State's second largest river basin, and reallocation of water supplies in Oregon's Deschutes River Basin. In addition, she counseled private clients on various regulatory matters, both water and energy related. She now holds a joint appointment as a senior lecturer at Penn State Law and a research fellow with the Penn State Institutes of Energy and the Environment. In this role, she's researching how water and conflict play out in a region that includes Marcella Shale development, the Chesapeake Bay, and flood excuse me, flood prone rivers. She has also started researching the law and policy implications of biofuels development, helping co-author a chapter entitled U.S. Law and Policy and the Biofuel Industry, forthcoming in a 2015 book about biofuel law and policy in a variety of countries across the world. Laura, we're very much looking forward to you speaking today. And at this point, I'd like to turn it over to you. Great. Sarah, thank you for that introduction. Um, and thanks for everybody for taking the time. This follows up actually on a presentation and it's, uh, that I did for the new bio team in, in direct. Um, I've given it a very boring title, um, U.S. Biofuel Law and Policy, a quick overview of U.S. law and policy affecting second generation biofuels. But really what I, when I was giving the last presentation, realized I could probably give this a much more interesting title which is why law and policy is reacting to things like tax fraud, corruption, um, and different sorts of pressures that are really affecting the US law and policy, and it's driving you guys all crazy. That's not quite a neat title, um, but I really wanted to give you effectively the overview and some understanding on why it's been so difficult to develop second generation biofuels. And a lot of that really is linked with what's happening on the, the legal side, the policy side, and so forth. Happy to, um, if quick questions come up during the conversation, please feel free to ask. Otherwise, I'll try and say, excuse me, save enough time at the end for plenty of questions. Um, Sarah did mention that we have a book chapter forthcoming shortly. Um, it's with the publisher right now and hopefully will come out sometime this year. But it is a book that's looking at the global biofuel law and policy across the world in different countries. Uh, and ours is really focused on the U.S. side. Another book author is writing mainly on transportation issues in the U.S. And so hopefully all of these will knit together and be a good resource for folks. Uh, so why does this matter? Um, you know important questions to consider. You have a lot of the industry pieces that are in place, but a lot of questions are really related to what are the results. You know, a lot of money has gone into this, but what are we seeing? How do we get to predictable industry development? How do we take the next steps to commercialization? Um, there are also issues related to the decline of the ground transportation sector, motor gasoline consumption. Basically, the amount of gas is actually declining. Um, there's been some decline in the use of coal, oil, and other liquids. And right now, we have the confounding factor of low oil prices and a lot of questions as to how long they'll stay low or what's likely to happen with that. Some of the other questions are, you know, have the aviation and military sectors really playing a role in biofuels? And you have also experiments happening at state or regional levels across the country. And again, that's, that's causing some ripples in the system. Um, so I wanted to touch on all of those. And again, if you look actually at the development of all of these things, there's a, a long and sort of colorful history. Very briefly, and I'm showing you charts I'm sure you've seen before, this is from the EIA Annual Energy Outlook in 2013. Basically, their prediction was for liquid biofuels to be at about 1% of share of total U.S. energy consumption. A little bit rosier if you look at the early release of 2014, which was actually released in December of 2013. They look at it and say, wow, we've doubled, looking at about 2% for liquid biofuels. Uh, in the most recent projection, they've gone back down to the 1%. Um, this is from a run done in November 2014. Um, so, you know, right in there, and was just trying to find more recent numbers. And again, just kind of looking how biofuels fits into the overall energy picture for the United States. Renewable energy supply, again, from the EIA, you can look at different projections. You have solar, geothermal, a couple different kinds of biomass, uh, wind, liquid biofuels, wood biomass, and hydro as part of the overall U.S. renewable energy supply. Um, 
Ethanol production in the U.S. in general has been a little bit unpredictable. If I can get myself an arrow here, you look up here, you know, and the numbers or the amount is is taking a dip. These are through 2013, um, and I'm not sure what they are through today, but gives you a, a sense of the the really rapid rise of ethanol from uh, the early 90s, in particular, uh, on up, and then sort of the dip that's happening right now. All of this acts as a confounding factor for this industry to some extent. But let me give you a little bit more in terms of the sort of arc, the 40 years plus of developing federal law and policy that really makes a difference into that rise in ethanol production in the United States. I took my arrow off to the side here. 1970s, um, you had the energy crisis happening in the United States where you had the price of gas going from a little bit hard to believe around 40 cents a gallon to about $1.20 um, or $1.80 and really going up. You had the 1973 oil crisis caused by OPEC oil export embargo, a 1979 oil crisis caused by the Iranian Revolution. A uh, bit of a price shock coming later in the 90s by the Gulf War. But the U.S. really started to think about um, how to deal with modern large-scale production of biofuels. Um, this led to the Energy Security Act in 1978. It was really the first time a government program shifted from promoting oil and gas to supporting production of fuel from renewable sources. Keeping going a little bit, 1980s, you had um, some sleepily named things like tax reform acts. Um, but within there were tucked different pieces of the law that really uh, looked at uh, different kind of exemptions, um, subsidies for ethanol, motor fuel, excuse me, the Alternative Motor Fuels Act really helped set up the CAFE standards, um, basically the corporate average fuel economy incentives which really was looking at the manufacture of vehicles that used alcohol or natural gas fuels. Um, and so those standards were set up during the 1980s. 1990s, again, you don't think of finding this kind of law in the Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act. Um, but things like that created incentives to reduce mobile source pollutants. Uh, the 1992 Energy Policy Act really created the Department of Energy's Clean City Program. It helped expand standards to include additional commercial and residential appliances. 1998, you saw the Energy Conservation Re Reauthorization Act, as well as the Transportation Equity Act. All of these really helped support the idea of a homegrown ethanol production, if you will. Going into the 2000s, again, a whole stack of laws that kind of helped lead towards the production of ethanol generally. Um, 2004, Jobs Creation Act. 2005, the Energy Policy Act, which I'll come back to in just a second, but helped set up the Renewable Fuel Standards, or RFS-1. 2006, um, a focus on developing um, renewable biofuels for aviation. 2007, and then I'll, I'll come back to the Energy Independence and Security Act, RFS-2. But there are also supports through the Farm Bill, uh, and then also through the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, the Stimulus Act. Uh, also in 2009, you had the Defense Reauthorization Act. I'm giving you a chronology right now, but I will, I'll come back to sort of teasing this apart by topic in just a minute, too. 2010, um, you had a 2012, excuse me, Military Memorandum of Understanding on Biofuel Use the 2014 Farm Bill, and then in 2014, the ASTM Standards for Biojet Fuel. All of this actually, again, is sort of a big arc um, of developing how these pieces fit together. So really, from 1978 to 2004, you really had the promotion of what are known as first-generation biofuels, uh, really thinking about um, food-based feedstock, i.e. sugars, grains, starches, corn, sugar cane, things like that, and ultimately to produce ethanol and biodiesel. I mentioned some of these law and policy supports. Uh, again, the 1973 energy crisis led to a suite of laws. It's actually five separate laws that were part of the National Renewable Energy Act. 1980, Energy Security Act targeted the new sources of renewable energy and, again, provided subsidies um, of 40 cents to 60 cents per gallon. In 1990, you saw, again, that Reconciliation Act, which really went from the idea of biofuels as energy security to the idea of regional economic development. And one thing, just as an overarching theme for this, is we're starting to get into the area of law and policy where 
production of energy just for energy's sake is one goal, but there are lots and lots of competing goals, economic development, um, security questions, et cetera. And so these laws, I think one of the things I would say, looking at all of them collectively, are really being asked to do a lot, which really complicates the picture. And we're get, about to get much more complicated here. 2005 to 2014, the idea of really promoting a second and third or beyond generation of biofuels, really trying to get out of the food versus fiber debate and get into non-food based feedstock, grasses, non-federal forest biomass, I'll come back to that one in a second, wastes, residues, um, algae, other things like that. Really looking at products that are ethanol, biodiesel, drop-in biofuels, biojet, other products that basically don't rely on food sources to be able to actually provide biofuel type um, products. Example laws and policy, again I mentioned earlier the 2005 Energy Policy Act, RFS1. The purpose of this was to really help grow the biofuel industry and address um, questions like the food versus fuel discussion. George Bush, um, you had people across the aisle on both sides of it. Uh, this quote happens to be from George Bush saying, hey, this promotes dependable, affordable, and environmentally sound production and distribution of energy for America's future. 2007, um, RFS1 was expanded into what's now known as RFS2 through the Energy Independence and Security Act. Really what this did is to say, we're going to mandate certain obligated parties that they must blend certain percentages of biofuels into the U.S. transportation fuel supply. And you must do it by very, very specific places and dates, excuse me. Uh, so the 2005 law generally was helping spark it, setting out ideas. 2007 came with very concrete stipulated, you must do this. So again, these are, this is the broad, excuse me, go forward, this is the broad general mandate from the 2007 law. It's specified by 2020, 2022 uh, certain amounts of conventional biofuels, certain amounts of biomass based diesel, certain amounts of advanced biofuels, and certain, certain amounts of cellulosic biofuels. If you look um, here in particular, the question about cellulosic biofuels increasing from 2012 all the way up to this amount in 2022. Tremendous number of questions whether or not the industry could actually produce the amount that was being mandated here. So I want you to pay attention to cellulosic as I walk you through kind of the sequence of events that happens next. Um, I am going to break the specific rules of PowerPoint that says don't put too much all on one PowerPoint slide. And the reason that I want to do this though is for you to sort of see what actually happened with the law and policy? Um, this is pulled together and, and backed out of um, the Environmental Protection Agency's record of what has happened actually with the law and policy development. If you are interested in learning more and reading through all of the gory details on this, the website is at the bottom and that's where these documents are pulled from. So 2007, great. We have rules finalized that really implement the renewable fuel standard, the RFS-1. No problem, that's pretty straightforward. 2002, we have some technical amendments actually to the RFS, it should say RFS-1. 2009, a, no, a proposed rulemaking now coming in, um, I think actually related to the RFS-2. Really, and the goal for the RFS-2 and the notice of the proposed rulemaking at this point is to implement those four separate standards for the chart that I showed you on the page before. 2010, great. March, you have the draft program final rule issued. May, the final rule is supposed to be effective. And in June of 2010, things start to go haywire. There's a partial withdrawal notice issued for the RFS-2 saying, mm, okay, we got part of this right, part of it not right. We're going to go ahead and issue, though, in July, a notice of proposed rulemaking for the 2011 standards. So if you're really thinking about actually implementing what's shown in the picture on the right, those numeric counts and mandates for the different types of biofuels, this all came to be. December um, basically said, great, we've got the standards in place for the RFS2. We have the program amendments. We know what we're going to do. 
2011, um, July, basically looking at a notice of proposed rulemaking for what the standard should be in 2012. Again, kind of predictable. And we're going to look at the 2013 um, biomass-based diesel volume. During this time period, Canada basically says, you know, we're doing a certain number of, we're growing biofuel. Is what we are doing OK for your purposes? So they come and actually approach the US Environmental Protection Agency. The US says, fine. Again, things start to get really wacky here for a little bit. January 2012, going to publish the final rule amendments. We're going to tell you what the volume and percent requirements are for meeting each of those. March, we're going to get a ton of pressure. We're going to withdraw the notice of direct final rules. Uh, we're going to issue the bio biomass-based diesel volume for RFS2. We're going to propose some amendments to the program. During November 2012, you have a couple of the major industry groups coming through and basically saying, would you please reconsider um, what these are? December, we're going to backtrack, and we're going to withdraw parts of these. And then 2013 happens. API, as one of the industry groups, files a lawsuit and actually wins a favorable outcome. So during this whole process, basically from probably 29, 2009 on, they're working their way through court. They get a favorable outcome in a case regarding the cellulosic standard, where the Court of Appeals for the US uh, District Court, uh, actually the Court of Appeals out of DC, says, you know, it's nice that you have um, EPA, this idea of developing an overall industry. But what we're hearing from the industry is they cannot meet the cellulosic standard that you set out. Go back and rethink about it. February, they come back and EPA says, all right, we're going to do a new proposed rulemaking for 2013. Now you're starting to see that they're doing the rulemaking the year that the proposed fuel standards are in place. And oh, by the way, you're going to do a quality assurance program for the RIN, the identification number program. Because during this time period, you're starting to hear rumblings in the industry about having fraudulent uh, numbers associated with biofuel production that people are basically fraud fraudulently um, making up how many credits are available. So keep going a little bit. In May, you've got another set of technical amendments, more proposed rulemaking. June, more final rules. Um, EPA says, OK, to the industry, we're going to go you know, reject your petitions to reconsider now the 2012 volumes. So we're starting to lag behind where we should be. September. Um, SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, actually files complaint against a couple of the big petroleum companies for the fraudulent RINs. October, um, we're going to try and figure out exactly what the definition for heating oil regulations are. And EPA in November says, you know what, we don't think you can meet these levels of numbers um, for 2014. So instead of meeting what was mandated in that 2007 law, for the RFS2 program, we're going to decrease the numbers. So keep going. Um, 2014, again, things continue to fall apart. They basically say, all right, we've got this reconsideration proposed by the industry groups for the, the cellulosic biofuel standard. Again, EPA has effectively lost part of this in court. They come out with a direct final rule. They look at it and realize we're now behind, completely behind, where the compliance deadline for 2013 is now extended into 2014. Um, so we're trying to meet compliance requirements for the year before and the year afterwards. More final rules, more extensions, more guilty pleas. In December, EPA comes out with a very dry announcement that basically says, sorry, we're not going to finalize the standards. That's what it looks like. It's in the Federal Register. Um, and they effectively say, um, you know, we can't get there. And I want to walk you through some numbers before I walk you through what's happened in 2015. So under the 2007 law, the EISA is the in, um, energy, EISA is basically the um, Energy Independence and Security Act, excuse me. So this was what was mandated in this actual law. If you look at it for cellulosic, for example, that it would be an increasing amount for each year going forward. The proposed rulemaking basically said 
2011, this is how much you would need, 6.6 .6 million gallons, 8.65. So it's supposed to be increasing. This is where they basically backtrack and say, oh, just kidding, 6 million, and then jumping up to, 2017, or to 2014, 17 million gallons. Again, you can see it both with the cellulosic as well as biomass-based diesel. Um, again, if you look at total renewable requirements, this is under the law. This is the statute passed by Congress. And this is the total proposed rulemaking volumes for advanced biofuel. Here, we'll increase it, we'll increase it, Oop, we'll go back down. Here, we'll increase it to here, but we're going to go back down for 2014. Again, overall, if you look at it for all four um, sort of areas in the total requirements, um, it shows basically a decrease in 20, between 2012 to 2013 to 2014. So what do all of these numbers mean? Um, basically, again, EPA was looking at it and saying, we don't think we can get there. Yes, Congress, you've told us we must meet these mandates, um, but we're going to exercise effectively a waiver in the law that allows us to set rules in place that are less stringent, that are less reaching, if you will, um, for the higher numbers here. So 2014, um, again, I'm coming back to the slide that I already showed you. Here in December, they said, we can't reach those numbers. Um, this is what happens. So they announce it in November. They actually put it in the Federal Register in December. Um, but kind of everybody comes, breaks loose on this. So again, EPA very dryly says, in light of this delay in issuing the 2014 renewable fuel standards, uh, the compliance demonstration for 2013 will take place in 2015. On the uh, renewable fuel side, they basically said, hey, wait a second. You're adding uncertainty. Uh, it's hampering new investment, particularly in advanced biofuels such as cellulosic. Uh, but at least this is not using your waiver to, to decrease the annual blend requirements. Um, you can look at the quote, you know, we're glad EPA didn't make a huge mistake by finalizing a methodology for its adjustment that would have significantly undermined the program and we think damaged it irreparably. One view, different view uh, from the American Petroleum Institute. Hey, this rule is already in a, a year overdue. The administration has no intention of finalizing it. It's unacceptable. This is an example of government at its worst. Still a different view. Uh, you know, this is coming from the Friends of the Earth. The EPA's handling of the renewable fuel standard is causing absolute chaos. It called on Congress to reform the law to emphasize advanced biofuels rather than corn-based biofuel or corn-based ethanol. So huge range of opinions as to what's actually happening and how this is actually playing out. Um, question from the side is how much all of these setbacks are hindering the biofuel industry. I would say uh, greatly. Uh, and again, many of the folks probably on this can speak to what's actually happening. But this is creating a huge amount of turmoil and chaos, I think, in terms of how it's playing out. You know, predictable funding and financing is very difficult to come by if you don't know what the standards are going to be in any particular year. Yet at the same time, folks are actually pushing forward with developing um, biofuel um, production in a number of places. And I'll come back to that in a second. So in February this year, people said, you know what? We don't think uh, the RFS, the renewable fuel standards, is likely to happen in Congress. Um, you know, people getting together to sort of say, we don't, we don't have the bipartisan support for being able to deal with this. Um, you know, if we're actually supposed to come and, and take votes, we don't think we can get the votes. Um, so we're just really not sure that there's going to be anything that actually happens. Um, again, February, it's basically really thinking about um, having, trying to get back on track. EPA saying, you know, in February, we're going to try and figure out how to do three years worth of targets. Um, rulemaking is expected to be controversial, but, you know, we're going to wade through it. Um, so 2015 has already been a very interesting year in terms of biofuel law and policy. March, EPA basically says, hey, we're going to give some minor amendments to the cellulosic uh, waiver, and we're going to propose some rulemaking. March 10th, the industry groups file a complaint in federal court and say, wait a second. You have a mandatory duty to actually set these targets. And oh, by the way, you've missed the deadline. April uh, 10th, 
There's a proposed consent decree that the Un United States Department of Justice on behalf of the Environmental Protection Agency lodges or files uh, in that federal court to say, we actually are agreeing to a number of different things. We agree to a proposed schedule for the RFS for 2014 and 2015 that by June 1st, so in not very many days from now, we're going to get the proposed volume requirements out for 2015. And by November 30th, we'll finalize those volume requirements not only for 2014 and 2015. Furthermore, so here's the proposed consent decree. I don't think you can read it, but if you want to look at it, it is available on the website at the bottom of the page. They also say, outside of the consent decree, we're going to actually meet these deadlines. Uh, we're going to hit the 2016 deadlines by June 1st as well. We'll finalize those by November. Uh, we'll also look at the 2017 um, biomass-based diesel volume at the same schedule. And then we're going to repropose the volume requirements for 2014 to actually reflect the volume of renewable fuel used in 2014. I look at all of this and what I was not finding but hoping I would would be some sort of notice that they'd actually let people know about this, i.e. published it in the Federal Register, which is their official way of doing it. So they basically said, we need to give people at least 30 days notice. Maybe they're intending to do that after June 1st when they have the proposed volume requirements. Get those out the door, put them out for public notice, and then work on finalizing them. But again, these time frames are very, very close to where we are right now. Um, if you go forward, you also have in April guilty pleas in another fraudulent RIN scheme. Again, that's very pretty high profile in terms of the millions of dollars that are at stake here. So this has been a story of a lot of um, high hopes and hard implementation for this. Uh, again, it goes back to the question that was asked, um, which is how much is this really hindering things? From the work that I have done, um, both as a regulator but also working with people who are being regulated, Uncertainty is the worst thing, the hardest thing for people to deal with. People can live with good news, they can live with bad news, but unpredictability and uncertainty is very damaging um, for a number of things. And so what you have, and this is just sort of tracking through 2014, um, you know, the idea that EPA is reversing its renewable fuel standard and that it's a major victory for the oil companies. Um, Throw in there the biodiesel RIN fraud cases and guilty pleas. This is in New Jersey. It's happening in the Midwest. It's happening out of Australia. The amount of money involved with this is stunning. Um, people are getting sent to jail for this, um, you know, and people are basically saying, "Hey, you've you know perpetrated not only a, a fraud, but also on um, a renewable fuels program created to protect the nation's energy security and independence." Um, you know, we're going to pursue this to make sure that we have the integrity of the programs going forward. Uh, you have other editorials basically saying, renew this. This is the worst thing that's ever happened. Would you make it go away? Oh, you know, this is a New Mexico paper. Um, so very strong rhetoric associated with all of this. Other people saying, hey, wait a second, we can keep gas prices low by requiring fuel to produce, excuse me, to contain renewables. Um, you know, let's get out of the dependence on foreign sources of oil find out different ways of moving forward. And then finally, you know, some people saying, hey, can we actually really take this on? And the answer, again, so far seems to be no. There is no bipartisan consensus in Congress to figure out really what should be. So where are we now? Um, briefly, we're waiting, I think, for what the US EPA will say the actual mandates and requirements are. That information should be coming uh, pretty soon, i.e., by uh, June first, um, so less than a month away. And then I think everybody is sort of will roll up their sleeves and uh, probably work on the Environmental Protection Agency again to say they like it, they don't like it. There really is no easy way forward with the Environmental Protection Agency. So that's on the policy side from the direct uh, renewable fuel standards where things are. But there's a whole different world that's also out there. Um, at the federal level, and I want to take it at the federal level to the international level, and then I'm going to take it down to the state level a little bit. If you really look at things on the agricultural side, first, I guess if you go for supply, there are a number of different laws associated with the supply side of things. Um, agriculture, there's a number of different laws that are actually uh, embedded here. The Agricultural Risk Protection Act, the Farm Securities Act, 
the various farm bills all have uh, supports in there, maybe subsidies, maybe for research and development, but impetus is to really develop the biofuel supply side of things. Forestry and timber um, down here is a little bit interesting where there is a direct prohibition uh, in federal law to take biomass off federal lands. Uh, it's okay to actually use it um, to, from private lands, for example, but I think the real fear is that some, suddenly the uh, logging that had taken place across much of the western United States would really start to impact uh, federal forest lands. And so, interestingly enough, um, Tom Tidwell, who's the head of the U.S. Forest Service, spoke a couple years ago at a conference I was at, and he basically said the most important thing that he had to figure out was actually the potential for biofuels coming off forest lands to give them a revenue source to be able to actually maintain forests, which right now uh, in much of the western United States are tinder dry. In the meantime, they're not allowed to do it, so they're doing a lot of research and development um, on that side of things. On the demand side, there's also a couple of different things, and we've talked quite a bit about what's happening with the U.S. Department of Energy, um, excuse me, with the Environmental Protection Agency, but also that feeds into the U.S. Department of Energy, which is doing research and development, uh, technology development, various partnerships. The demand side, this is where actually a lot of the industry, I think, is being really pulled along. Transportation, um, for example, the Alternative Transportation Fuels Programs, Department of Energy's Clean Cities programs, all of which have been really instrumental, and you'll see a couple of examples here in a second, uh, on pulling the industry forward. Aviation and I will touch base um, again more in just a minute. And then the mili military has basically said, we're really going to help support this um, through the Defense Production Act. For a while, it basically said there is no allowance for using biofuels. This was changed. I believe in 2009, to specifically allow the use of biofuels. And again, in 2012, you have this MOU that basically says we are really going to tap into the use of biofuels uh, to supply energy um, for the, um, these different agencies and help move that forward. So transportation versus aviation, um, you know, we've been looking and been working with Paul Smith, who's currently with uh, Penn State, but to look at the ground sector transportation versus aviation sector, the idea right now that you've got better efficiency for vehicles, so you've got to reduce demand, the push for, uh, again, more gas efficient um, vehicles, and the regulated CAFE standards I already mentioned for vehicles by state and federal government to pr promote fuel efficiency. So you have less demand for fuel going into this, even as people are really struggling to deal with gas taxes and everything else. The flip side is on the aviation sector, you have a projected growth of 4 to 5 percent per year through 2050. You have a lot of concentrated customers, think there are not that many airports, uh, and where they go, you can't just take your plane to a nearby gas station and fill it up. You have to fill it up effectively at the refueling stations at that airport. Um, you have airports and militaries embracing sustainable alternative jet fuels. For example, Southwest Airlines basically recently announced that they were going to be refueling um, their planes out of uh, Sa San Francisco almost entirely on biofuels. And there's not a lot of viable alternatives to the current fuels. You really are looking at liquid high density drop-in uh, st sustainable jet fuel that you can just fill up your plane and go. But there's a lot of push to really proactively reduce carbon dioxide emissions um, from air transportation. So some benefits, um, potential price stability, regional rural economic development, job opportunities, environmental carbon emissions, lower greenhouse gas emissions, um, and then energy and national security. European law is actually also playing in this. Um, for example, in 2009, the European Commission basically said, we're going to shift from exempting your requirements to obligating our different member states. You must, as a member state of the European Union and the European Commission, reduce your overall carbon footprint, meet the 10% renewable fuel target by 2020, establish an emissions trading scheme, and require long-term policies. For a little while, the Euro European Commission basically was going to mandate anybody who flew their planes into anywhere in the EC had to meet these standards as well. They got pushed back from that, 
but really these are actually having a direct impact on places like the United States. So let me switch gears there um, for just a minute. That There are a lot of state experiments going on where some states, Tennessee for example, uh, Virginia is another, have really embraced the idea of biofuels. Tennessee has been working to develop, for example, the planet's longest biofuels corridor and basically connected it with a big state six-state par six partnership um, from basically Cleveland to Chattanooga um, to be able to really um, allow somebody to drive the I-75 corridor and make it from one end to the other without running out of biofuels. Um, again, Virginia, I mentioned, is really actively pr promoting it. So there are a lot of state laws really focused on what they can do to help support the um, industry. So even if things are fluctuating and uncertain at the federal level, the states have put a lot of money, a lot of investment, a lot of incentives, tax incentives and otherwise, into helping develop the industry. And there's California. California, as with many things, is the seventh largest economy in the world. And it, uh, as a state, realizes it can really push policy. And so they announced um, a number of years ago, actually, uh, California Assembly Bill AB 32 um, announced pretty aggressive greenhouse gas emission standards. Um, and they basically said, we are going to develop a different kind of mandate, if you will, if you are going to sell carbon, excuse me, fuels within the state, you must meet these standards. We're going to look at the life cycle of the overall fuel. Where did it come from? How much did it take to get there? We're going to actually enact this and see if we can't um, <laughs> kind of change the world in terms of how people are dealing with fuel, particularly for transportation purposes. Uh, as is the want in California, great, they file it, they put it out there, they get sued. The reason I'm showing you this cover for, um, there were two sets of cases, one through state courts where people were really challenging whether or not uh, the state had complied with the California Environmental Quality Act, CEQA, as well as other requirements under state law. But there was also a federal court filed, a court case filed. It went up to the Ninth Circuit. And by the time it did, if you look at the cast of characters, um, who are on the plaintiff's side of things, um, and Sarah, if you can help just pull the arrow over. There we go. Um, this kind of reads like a who's who of people interested in this. So yes, it's about California, but really this is a national case. Um, Rocky Mountain Farmers Union, the Redwood County, Minnesota corn and soybean growers, Fresno, fine, we might expect that, the Dairy Campaign, Renewable Fuels Association, the American Fuel and Petrochemical Manufacturers Association, the American Trucking Association, uh, et cetera, suing the state in a variety of capacities, um, generally official capacities. But so this case goes up uh, to the Ninth Circuit. It is appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court. The U.S. Supreme Court rejects reviewing it, so the Ninth Circuit case stands, basically upholding California's laws. Combined, the state court decision and the federal court decision did ask for some tweaks to the system overall. And so California kind of dusted itself off after this whole court um, and held the California Air Resources Board uh, in February this year, held a sort of, we're dusting off the standards now that we've made it through the court processes. We've heard what the courts have told us and where we need to modify this. Um, so they hold a hearing in February. It ends up being a three, three and a half hour hearing our hearing of the industry telling California why it cannot possibly meet these standards. Uh, California nonetheless is moving forward. They just held a couple weeks ago in April, I guess, another per public workshop to really think about these new standards and where things stand uh, with the idea that they're going to readopt the low carbon fuel standards in July of this year. So again, kind of stay tuned on that. Um, to top things off, just this past week, um, Governor Brown, in the midst of what is one of the worst droughts California has ever experienced, basically said, we're going to actually reduce our gas reduction goals. We had a pretty aggressive goal. Um, it was 20% by 2020. We're going to increase it 40% below 1990 levels by 2030. Um, this made international news uh, in terms of how they were actually going to really accomplish this. But it goes into and plays out with the low carbon fuel standards. So California hasn't been content um, to stay with just itself, but in 2013, I'm going back a little bit, California 
Oregon, Washington, and British Columbia basically banded together uh, to develop what they were calling the Pacific Coast Action Plan on Climate and Energy. And the idea was that each state and the government of British Columbia would all adopt low carbon fuel standards up and down so you had a transportation corridor up along the west coast that all had the same standards. Uh, to really think about things like zero emission vehicles, um, research, um, thinking about sort of the combined efforts of all of these things. Um, so if you look carefully um, in terms of who is here in this picture, they have John Kitzhaber of Oregon, Jay Inslee of Washington, Governor Brown, um, and a premier, I think, from British Columbia, all supporting it. Some people have later said, wait a second, it's not for the states alone to decide to do international treaties with other countries. That's for Congress alone. But here you see the states effectively going alone to say, hey, we're not waiting for Congress to do this. Fast forward a little bit, Oregon actually just became the second uh, state in the country to adopt this. And I'd like you to note something. The governor, Kate Brown, is not Governor John Kitzhaber. Um, but Governor Kate Brown makes it official. She signs the bills pushing Oregon's low carbon fuel standard. She basically says, hey, we really support the goals of reducing greenhouse gas. Um, we're experiencing a tremendous amount of drought. We need to do our part, et cetera. So this is where, in part, things get really interesting, um, among other things. If you look at this, too, this is the same article, but just the official online view. What you have, the House Minority Leader saying, yeah, OK, you, uh, we know you passed this, but you had an issue with Oregon's Clean Fuels Program. And the former first lady, who was not married to John Kitzhaber, and how much she had worked on this when she was ostensibly serving in the role of first lady, um, how much she got paid, how much she did not pay in taxes. All of this actually brought um, her, her fiance, former governor John Kitzhaber, who was a fourth term governor reelected last November, uh, and caused him to resign. Uh, huge in flap that's still playing out. The Federal Bureau of Investigation, FBI, is investigating both Sylvia Hayes as well as John Kitzhaber. So if you go back, the fact that this was actually adopted um, is kind of unusual, where basically, yes, it was a signature policy for John Kitzhaber, but it was really embroiled with a scandal of how much um, Sylvia Hayes' environmental consulting business profited from, you know, as this article says, her access to the governor and the state bureaucracy. This story is still unfolding, but again, as of now, Oregon has basically made this official. Washington State is also working on the, uh, the same, um, and the Washington State Legislature was going working on adopting a cap and trade program. Um, this session, they are in their, I think, first special session and really tied up with an overall budget question. I don't see Washington necessarily adopting it. Maybe they will. Maybe they won't. Different parts of the country, um, for example, more in the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic states, you have the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, uh, was really looking at creating a cap and trade market system. Um, currently, it's the states of Connecticut, Delaware, Maine, Maryland, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, New York, Rhode Island, and Vermont. Um, New Jersey had been part of it and dropped out. Um, they had to do a little bit of a reset basically in 2014. But they're currently really working on um, auctioning off partic particular credits, et cetera. There is an upcoming auction in June. Again, may be worth uh, watching how they're actually doing this and developing. They have 23 days to go before their next auction. Um, People have looked at it and said, all right, there are at the federal level, again, going back to the greenhouse gas emissions and federal um, deadlines requiring states to actually think about their greenhouse gas emissions coming from existing power plants. States are starting to really think about, well, could we get into existing cap and trade programs? Can we join either what's happening along the West Coast, California's low carbon fuel standards, or can we join the regional greenhouse gas, gas, gas initiative? Uh, so a lot of this is getting real kind of right now in terms of policy. So what's next? Where do we go? Um, you know, I think there needs to be further assessment of both the short and long-term impacts of the current policies. Questions of, you know, has the RFS, either one or two, been successful? Where do we go with second, third, fourth generation biofuels? 
Does something like the multinational or international cooperation for aviation and other whites really help provide a stable base for the industry, even as you have this fluctuating national policy? Are the results of local, state, or other regional approaches really helping? And can you, if you had more consistent policy, really affect and address these impediments through price, supply chain, investment, or otherwise? Um, there are a number of legal and policy resources um, that are really just focused on this. Uh, there's a legislative library from the U.S. Department of Energy. The Alternative Fuels Data, S Data Center has a tremendous wealth of information on each state's laws. They do a, tr a great job of keeping this really up to date. And the EIA, of course, has issues and trends where they're really looking at uh, different federal and state laws. Um, so the team that helped put the chapter together, Christina Dahman was a recent law graduate, um, worked with us on this. Um, myself here in the middle and the red scarf, and then Paul Smith has been a professor of bio, bio products marketing at Penn State. So that's who put the book chapter together. Um, and again, we're waiting for that to come out, uh, hopefully shortly, to answer any questions that you might have. I'm going to go back to this. Thank you. Um, please type your questions in the chat pod. It looks like we already have one. Um, so we'll just get started with that one. So our first question is, um, she asks, how much do you think all of these setbacks are hindering the biofuels industry? I mean, certainly um, it, it's a major, uh, major impact um, that it's having. But, you know, in addition, when, when you compare it to sort of the engineering uh, issues that we face and, and the other things that might be hindering the industry, um, how, how does policy issues kind of scale um, in terms of comparing them to, to some of the other barriers? That's a great question. Uh, you know, I don't know which hiccups may be the harder ones to deal with, an engineering question or a chemistry question or a different kind of question like that. I do know from working with folks, for example, in the wind industry, that the real fluctuations in uh, federal tax policy or even state tax policy of yes, there's a credit this year, no, there's not a credit next year, made it nearly impossible for those companies to get loans or to get financing to actually build the projects. So yes, you may have an idea, you may have worked out the technical kinks, but you're not going to have a bank say, yeah, we'll, we'll fund you. People are paying so much attention. I mean, just the, the number of times the RFS standards are in the news, it's, it's, it seems like nearly an hourly or a daily occurrence where something major happens and somebody's lobbying Congress for one thing or another. That's a very unpredictable and poor um, funding environment. So I think from the financial side, it just makes it that much harder to actually get the financing to allow a commercially viable project. It also doesn't give incentives to state programs to really put in a lot of funding. And I think the other thing I should have said is, you know, all of this was happening. There's great promise. We're going to pass this in 2007. Um, I, I left out, obviously, a major instance um, of what happened in 2008. The bottom dropped out. So yes, you had all this proposed investment in something new, and then suddenly you had folks scrambling to keep anything together as the d economic downturn hit. So to some extent, the timing of this was really unfortunate um, for creating a new stable industry, but the continued ping pong match that is happening and the continued you know, fraud, news about fraud, the continued um, lack of bipartisan cooperation within Congress, all of that makes it a lot harder. Thanks. Our next participant uh, points out that you mentioned LCFS. Are there other current or pending laws that might indirectly affect biofuel industries? The low carbon fuel standards up and down the West Coast are really the, the, the biggies. And again, um, I think the, um, the carbon uh, the carbon questions, the cap and trade questions, um, I think are, in, are part of that as well. Other things that could really affect biofuels, I think there's some potential interest in ha thinking about how this is more on the positive, motivational, how do we do this, but can we stack benefits, for example? Could we stack the benefits of biofuels and also get credit for, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, for buffer zones along impaired waterways? So how does the Clean Water Act play into this? Um, as, as states or regions, for example, the Chesapeake Bay or the Mississippi or Puget Sound are really struggling to deal with stormwater, non-point source runoff questions. So I can see overlaps at different places really actually affecting the biofuel uh, industry. 
I think one of the really difficult things is why um, is the current price of gas um, being significantly low. Uh, in listening to a number of people think about that at a conference this past year, they basically said, look, the price of gas fluctuates. We're in this for the long haul. We're not going to react to the immediate price. We're going to keep developing this. But that's really actually thrown the indi energy industry as a whole into a little bit of a tailspin where people for different companies are getting laid off. Uh, again, it's how much do we invest um, for doing this. The development of um, shale, um, hydraulically fractured shale across the U.S. has also changed the energy picture. Um, so in terms of current and pending laws, it's a little bit hard to say. Again, the California example, now Oregon, is I think really driving things pretty significantly. Um, Clean Air Act bears watching because uh, that's the other thing that can really drive and affect things. U.S. Environmental Protection Agency is working on a rulemaking, really dealing with greenhouse gas emissions to a lot of um, pushback. Um, but they are moving forward and implementing it at the same time they're doing this. So a couple of things to stay tuned to, I guess. Our next question uh, comes from Tristan, and it has to do with tax credits. Um, he asks if you have any thoughts on why the advanced biofuel industry hasn't received the types of refundable tax credits from Congress that have been given to the corn ethanol and first-gen biodiesel industries. Yeah, great question. I mean, uh, officially people will say, hey, we're hitting a blend wall, um, uh, you know, of no more than 10 percent, and that's really been covered by ethanol. Um, a darker view of this might be that the, um, the corn industry, the corn ethanol industry, and first generation biodiesel industries are, um, they're playing for keeps in this game. And they are lobbying Congress like crazy, um, and very much systematically working to keep out, I would say, subsidies to other entities. Um, if you look again at who has put up a significant amount of money to be involved with these court cases, it's really the folks that, that either um, don't like it as a whole or actually represent the ethanol industry. They have no interest in having somebody else get the subsidies that they're currently getting. Um, so maybe that's a darker view of the world, but I guess that's a, you know, a real high-level read on what I would say is happening. Thank you. I have a question that maybe there's not a very easy answer to. I'm sort of just looking for your, your opinion and your thoughts. So, you know, you mentioned all of these state-specific standards against this backdrop of some federal uncertainty in policy. So do, do a multitude of state-specific standards and rules on fuels and greenhouse gas emissions help or hinder the industry when compared to concrete sweeping federal mandates? So. Does it set precedence to relegate fuel standards as an issue best left to the states? Or does it show support and buy-in that's regionally specific that could strengthen federal policy moves? It's a, it's a great question. If I'm an industry, I'd probably rather have pretty consistent standards across the different states. But at this point, folks are really familiar with California kind of going on its own and actually ending up, because it is such a big market and most industries cannot afford to um, ignore it, they basically have to follow what California does. And California is very aware of its role as a trendsetter in this. Um, you know, right now they're really struggling mightily to deal with the drought conditions that are out there. But in general, um, they're, they're not unaware that the policies and the laws they set there end up actually setting national policies and trends. Because there's a de facto, OK, I have to meet these standards in California. I will just go ahead and meet them for every state that I'm operating in so I can continue to access the California market. Um, it's happened time and time again in multiple different ways. And so sometimes, and then very often, the way the US federal system is set up is that for, it's for the states to experiment. And it's OK to have different, um, different rules and regulations if the federal government doesn't have a uniform rule or regulation. And that's, again, what I think you see happening is the states are actually further ahead um, in, in clearer policy, clearer laws in guiding things. So it's, the short answer is the way the system is supposed to work. But again, the longer answer is California often does and is leading the nation in this. Um, and that's actually allowing and creating tremendous number of headaches, but also a tremendous number of opportunities for how do you actually meet and comply with these things. What's the actual life cycle of a product? Does it count if it's sorghum from a particular place or some kind of cellulosic for someplace else? What fits those definitions? All of that's being worked out right now in a very public way. 
And I guess we'll see what, what happens on, on June 1st, if anything, uh, to answer how that shakes out uh, in the future for this year as well. Mm -hmm. So I guess this next question is really along the same lines conceptually. You, you have a lot of experience with land use and, and natural resource litigation. Um, so you, know, you talked about the issue with federal lands, especially the Forest Service. Um, when we think about regional potential for development of advanced biofuels and cellulosic fuels in specifically, when you kind of compare an area with a few large parcels of public land versus many smaller parcels of private land, the former, you know, it's easy to have a more uniform policy and the latter, sometimes it's harder to, to get buy-in from a lot of different people to do the same thing. You know, given that public lands are hindered by federal policy, um, in the example that you gave with the Forest Service, you know, which of those is sort of preferable from a development perspective? So I guess the, the question is, do you, do you wait for an elegant policy solution for, for a consolidated um, forward move? Or, or do you look at a more grassroots from the ground up buy-in from individual small landowners? Um, I guess I would, I would approach that question. It's a great question. I would approach that from a real practical standpoint, which is I'm not sure I'd wait for the federal government and Congress to enact any sort of elegant solution to this. Um, it, the stakes are just too high. There's too much money. There's too much lobbying. There's too, too much rhetoric. Um, and again, I alluded earlier to the fact that these laws are being asked to really do a lot. They're not, they're not at the point of being elegant anymore. They're being asked to provide for environmental benefits and economic security and avoid dependence on foreign oil sources and all of that. All of that makes it a very complex policy environment in which to work. So I actually do think there are probably more elegant homegrown solutions. Again, doesn't make it easier. You know, if I'm a if I'm a company and I'm investing the capital to really develop a a plant, I want to know that I've got a source of supply and it's not going to dry up. But one of the ways to do it is through contracts, longer term contracts, for example, um, or work within state laws that again are a little bit more potentially more secure and more reliable than what is happening at the federal level. I think if you wanted to wait until there was an elegant solution at the federal level, uh, you, could, you could spend a lot of years waiting and hoping and not get done what you wanted to get done. Thanks. Um, we have some time for one or two more questions. If anyone wants to kind of finish our discussion with a, a final question, you know, think about it, type it into the chat pod. In the meantime, while you're thinking, Laura, is there anything else, uh, any other final thoughts you want to leave us with today after all we've learned? I think one of the things I was really, I mean, again, I mentioned I gave a, a brief um, update on this in February. And in pulling together the more materials for this, it was breathtaking how much had happened between February and now. Um, just a tremendous amount of noise and friction in the system, the lawsuits, the settlements, the proposed action. So this really is, uh, you could almost write a soap opera about this, but this is a, you know, tune in daily on, um, you know, at a certain time to figure out what has happened. Um, but it's, it, the changes on the law and policy side are happening and they're happening in real time and they're happening very quickly. Um, so that's one of the observations I would give back to you is it's, it's coming from the courts, it's coming from the legislatures, it's coming from Congress. Um, it's coming in press releases, you know, again, to sort of set the nature of the conversation. Um, but any piece of those, particularly on the legislature versus the court side, or even executive actions like a memorandum of understanding, can really swing how the industry is acting or uh, sort of the incentives that are built in. So it's a stay tuned frequently um, suggestion, I guess. Certainly that would involve a, a lot of different uh, sources of information, but for, for the average citizen, if, if you had to recommend one resource that they should sort of stay tuned into if they're interested in seeing these changes as they come out on a more or less live basis, uh, what would you recommend? I think being able to actually aggregate a couple of the different industry sort of news releases, and I would pick, you know, two or three different perspectives. Um, you know, this is the bread and butter for um, the, the first generation ethanol industry. Um, you know, if you can collate three or four different sources and get on their mailing lists, I think you'd have a very real-time understanding of what was going on. Different papers, Washington Post, for example, is, is covering this pretty closely. Um, 
Sacramento Bee. Um, so if you wanted to look at more sort of neutral slash public sources, there are a couple places to look at there. Great. Thank you so much. Um, this was a, an excellent overview, um, and I'm, I'm sure that this information is going to be referenced by a lot of time, um, even though we're seeing a lot of changes um, live. Almost. Laura, thank you so much for all of this excellent information, um, and thank you all for attending today.